Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Welcome to our annual conference in the Department of Social Work and Social Care at Kingston University. I think if my memory serves me well, this is the 13th year or so of running this conference series. We'd like to welcome our former students and our current students, partners in our regional Developing Together Social Work Teaching Partnership, fellow academics, practitioners, and our international participants. In our departments, we offer several courses at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. At undergraduate level, we offer a BA Social Work, which is a pre-qualifying course, and a non-pre-qualifying course for social work, um, a BA working with children and young people, social pedagogy. And at postgraduate level, we offer a Master's of Social Work. Um, we offer a fast track postgraduate diploma in social work, and we also offer um, a postgraduate diploma step up to social work. <clears throat> we also offer an MA in advanced social work and uh, practice education PIPs one and two. But we also do run a range of short courses, including the best interest assessor BIA and the safeguarding modules. We are also offering a fast growing PhD route with some fantastic great completion rates. So today, the theme of our conference today is social work in a global context, international research and practice. This fits in well with the theme for this year's World Social Work Day that was marked yesterday and themed co-building a new eco-social world, leaving no one behind. As a department of social work and social care, and I think like other departments in other universities, we have been leaving the experience of leaving no one behind in the way that we've been supporting students through COVID pandemic and working with partner agencies to support practice. I look forward to a very interesting uh, conference today, interesting discussions, interesting seminars discussions on what is happening across the world. And keeping with the World Social Work Day theme of co-building a new eco-social world, leaving no one behind, we would like to stand with our Ukrainian practitioners supporting the victims of the war. Without taking up too much of the conference time, I'd like to say a huge thank you to my colleagues in the department <clears throat> and in the university for organizing this conference. I'd also like to acknowledge our former head and now Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching, Professor Jen Lindsay, who will be retiring from academia at the end of this academic year, and would like to acknowledge her for a contribution of over 30 years to social work at Kingston University, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Jane, you've been a fantastic colleague. And I think on this note, I will hand over to our conference chair, Professor Malcolm Payne. Thank you. Enjoy the conference. Well, good morning, uh, colleagues, and I hope you're looking forward to uh, what looks like a fantastic and interesting programme that we're dealing with today and uh, looking at global issues in social work and more broadly. Uh, you can perhaps see that I'm wearing my Ukrainian uh, solidarity badge and uh, I just want to pay tribute to the ordinary people of Ukraine and to our friends and colleagues in uh, Central Europe who have responded to the present crisis there um, and although that's something very different from the main topics that we're dealing with today uh, concerning ourselves with the COVID-19 crisis that we've been all been living through, uh, there are connections and the connections are about uh, an increasing involvement of social work in disaster work, in the concerns of great changes in the world and the responses of people to it. And those are the issues that we're going to be trying to grapple with in this conference. And I think as a social work profession globally, we, we are needing to think through and grapple with uh, more uh, significantly in our work. Yes, of course, the people who have needs, childcare needs, adult services needs, a whole range of needs that we have worked with over the years 
and we want to continue to help the people who need our help in every setting. We have also to learn how alongside that to respond to the crises and disasters that affect uh, sometimes uh, a, a quite small part of our globe, but increasingly have global implications. And we need to learn how to uh, analyze and connect with um, both the continuing needs that we must respond to and the crisis and disaster needs that we respond to. This is an important new development in, in social work and its global links. So it's really important to begin to have those conversations everywhere. And this is a really important thing to be doing here today for us. Um, those of you who are regular attenders at these uh, meetings know that every year uh, Kingston University has organized um, uh, often strikingly prescient uh, conferences uh, around the research and current issues in social work and we're certainly going to be doing that today. Now the way in which the conference works is that there will be two groups of three plenary speakers in the morning with an opportunity for discussion which you do through the uh, the online chat uh, bit of the uh, program. Um, so what we're simply going to do is to move through the three speakers in the first session which uh, I hope we're going to start a little bit early so which that will uh, finish at about 10.45 and then give the opportunity for some some discussion. So in our first session we have three plenary speakers. The first is uh, Dr Baginski and Mary Baginski from King's College London. Then there's Dr Johnson Chung from Hong Kong University and uh, Dr Vincent Mabvirira um, uh, from South Africa. So we're going to move through those in order. So can I start by welcoming you, saying we really appreciate your taking part in this conference. Um, one of the wonderful things about the, the, the uh, technology that we're using to hold these conferences means that people can join us from all over the globe and we're delighted to welcome our colleagues who are making contributions uh, from uh, different parts of the world. So we'll move on now and can I ask Mary Baginski to uh, start with the first of the preliminary addresses. Mary. Thank you Malcolm. What I'm going to be talking about is speculative um, but it's informed speculation, at least I hope it's informed. It's looking at what the impact of COVID has had or possibly had on the social work profession. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is mainly drawn on work done in this country and mainly but not exclusively on the children's social work sector. But I'm really interested in how people who are joining us from other countries reflect on what I'm going to see and see if there are similarities or differences because I think we all have a lot to learn from one another. So where I went at the beginning was to look at 15 local authorities, 15 children's services departments in local, 15 local authorities in England to see how they were making that very quick transition into COVID conditions and that work took place between probably the end of March 2020 through to the early May 2020. And then based on that, I looked at five case studies in five of those 15, looking at how multi-agency work, which underpins so much of children's social work, was also making that transition. And within that um, study, I also drew on the experiences of colleagues in five countries to get them to reflect on whether the our experience resonated with theirs. I also looked at child protection conferences, what was happening in England, what was how they were making the transition from being essentially having professionals discussing families in a room, making that transition onto online. Um, 
And also I've been very fortunate to work with one London borough over the past two years to look at how their social workers have adapted and continue to adapt because as far as social work is concerned, we're not through it yet. I also got some funding to look at what we called easements to the Care Act. They were easing up on the uh, duties on local authorities um, that are around the Care Act for adults services. And also I've been very fortunate to work with a group of graduates who qualified during COVID-19 and to catch their experience of what it was like to do placements, qualify and move into practice during this very strange time. And also, I mean, as, as with all of us, I suppose, we've been talking to one another and I've had discussions with local authorities across the four countries of the UK to try and get some idea of how my experience was resonating with others. What changed? Social workers moved very quickly from their home, from their offices into homes. We're only just one week short of the two year anniversary of when the lockdown was announced on the 23rd of March. But two years ago today, the Prime Minister said, now is the time for everyone to stop non-essential contact and travel. And three days later, he said the UK could turn the tide of coronavirus in 12 weeks. Well, we know that wasn't the case, but actually there was a window for local authorities and others to plan and give them some chance to prepare. Others, some were in a much better position than others as far as IT was concerned, but what was achieved in those early weeks, both before the lockdown was announced and straight afterwards was truly astounding. Many local authorities were already planning to introduce Microsoft Teams or were in the early stages of doing so, but none of them thought that actually it would be so important to social work practice during a pandemic and beyond. As I said, social workers moved from their office into their homes. Most of them did. There were very few social workers in offices. Assessments were often conducted virtually and all cases were RAG rated. That's a method adopted from project management to identify high, medium and low risk cases. Meetings and supervisions moved onto a virtual platform. Multi-agency work took on a new dimension. In some areas, health disappeared completely because they had other priorities and schools became the eyes on the community, both of those children who were in school and those children who were not attending school. Local authorities reported much better attendance by other professionals at meetings. Health, GPs, psychiatrists, were actually showing up to child protection conferences in a way that wasn't known beforehand. In many cases, student placements were suspended. And when they did return to the office, they often returned to quite empty offices or were practicing from home. And the government's response, um, well, they did relax duties on children and adult services, as I mentioned. But the actions they took came in for quite a lot of criticism because it wasn't actually what local authorities needed. But what it meant was that local authorities, both in adult and children's services, were often in the position of making it up as they went. A lot of responsibility felt fell onto them. The unseen. Um, I think if you have virtual, com virtual assessments, virtual visits to home, there were real concerns about how effective that was, how much could be seen in a home, and also the things that weren't being seen, and also people who would be in a room when a meeting was taking place who shouldn't have been there, but were off camera. Supervision moved onto um, a virtual platform very quickly, as did team meetings, and they seemed to work for experienced social workers and for those working in teams that they operated well beforehand. It didn't work well for newly qualified social workers and it didn't work well when new people had come into authorities and not had the time to establish relationships. Families, engagement with families. While some people, some families had internet and good data provision, some did not. And we did have situations where you had professionals who were able to see one another on screen while families were joining on the telephone. 
and all that has to say for how we valued their contribution and also how we could maintain engagement. And certainly during the child protection conference work I did, there was a real concern about the conferences themselves taking on or being seen to take on lesser importance because of a sense of order or what was described a sense of propriety not necessarily being there. Having looked at the challenges, can we now look at what is emerging? It's difficult, really difficult, to get a picture of what is happening at a national level. It seems that offices are not very busy, even if social workers are. And many social workers are still working from home, even if they're making as many home visits to families, meetings are still online. I've been working with the local authority quite intensively over the last seven weeks, and the expectation from me was that we might be meeting in the same room, but that isn't the case. The expectation is that meetings will stay online, and I'm very interested in other people's experiences of that. We've also seen the consequences of what was hidden. There have been reports of child deaths and serious injuries that occurred during this period. The signs were there early on, with numerous reports in the early months of how few referrals were coming in and of the cases that were coming in of the complexity and seriousness that they were displaying. In children's social care, the tragic death of two children, Arthur Labino Hughes and Scott Hobson, at the hands of their parents and carers, has led to a blame game by sections of the media on social workers. And although he has since been supportive of social workers, the first reaction of Nadim Zahawi, the Secretary of State with responsibility for children's social care, was to say the children should be removed from their families if there is any inkling of harm to them. According to local authorities, referrals since these two cases have shot up and they were already high after children returned to school and damage was seen. We're also seeing a significant increase in the number of children being taken into care, as happened following the review of the death of baby Peter Connolly, which is now 15, 16 years ago. And we all know the impact that that had on social work for quite a number of years. Perhaps surprisingly, demand on adult social care was light at times during the pandemic. So, for example, adult social care didn't report that it wasn't managing and the easements weren't used to any great extent. But in January of this year, when we thought we were coming through this at the time of Omicron, 51% said that the workforce capacity was putting the delivery of services at risk. The reported high number of experienced social workers leaving the profession is, intensify is intensifying the impact of this demand in both adult and children's services. Hybrid meetings are becoming the norm. If we take child protection conferences, it seems that most authorities are trying to get the chair of the conference, social worker and parents into the same room with professionals joining virtually. But there are said to be consequences for the reports. While health representation is said to be holding up to some extent, it's reported that there is less sharing of reports by other professionals, throwing more back on the social worker to construct facts and work things out during the conference. Students, I think we really do need to understand how prepared they really felt for practice when they qualified during this time. And in some parts of the country, buildings that house social workers previously are being sold off as many are on prime development sites and the income from that will help to pay for budget deficits. So there will be fewer places for some social workers to return to. So what are the legacy? Previous notions of how to conduct an assessment, engage in direct practice and offer student placements are amongst the many activities that have been tested and reshaped. And while face-to-face -face contact remains a core aspect of social work practice, digital engagement with families and other professionals is here to stay. Perhaps as a way of dealing with demand, 
but it's also been suggested that it is being used as a way of managing confrontation. We don't have a clear implication, a clear idea of the implications of this for families, and that really is an area which needs quite urgent investigation. It remains to be seen if other agencies' participation will continue at the level it reached during the pandemic, but if dropping into a meeting for a 15 or 20 minute session replaces reports that were in detail and could be shared in advance, something will change. I'm not saying whether that will be for the better or the worse, but there is change. Social work is fundamentally about communication and building relationships. Online working has advantages in terms of efficiency, but not necessarily enhancing the quality of those communications, nor of relationships. I started by saying that what I was going to go through was speculation. It's far too early to assess the consequences of a crisis that has shifted the way we've operated as a society, and at a time when the world is witnessing another tectonic shift in geopolitics with massive consequences for individuals and populations. When a new year is approaching, pundits are often asked to make forecasts for the coming year, and then they're asked to come back 12 months later and reflect on how successful they've been. Maybe Kingston University would like to reconvene in five years time and assess how accurate some of these semi predictions have been and what has been the long term effect on social work. Thank you. Yes, the required disclaimer. They are my views and not the views of the funders. Thank you. And also, if I could just add, if anybody wants any of the reports that I mentioned of the work that I've been conducting, you can reach me um, by email by King's College. You'll find me quite easily. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for a, a very stimulating and um, starting off point so where people from Kingston and uh, in the UK generally can make a connection with some of these issues and see how their own experience connects with what's happened more widely. Uh, and now for a, a very different perspective, but perhaps there will be many shared things to be identified too in um, Johnson Chung's uh, discussion of um, uh, the social work profession in uh, the East and um, in relation to health inequalities to a really important area that social workers are, are worrying about now. So Johnson Chung. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to meet you all and thank you so much for having me here today in the, this um, seminar. And uh, I'm Johnson and I'm from Hong Kong, from the University of Hong Kong. And then I'm happy that I have the chance to um, share some of my previous work uh, over the last two years in uh, during COVID and especially um, uh, working on the relationships between COVID and social work. So um, this is the brief outline of my presentation. Actually, uh, my presentation will be based on uh, three of my previous uh, paper published in some of the social journals. I think we are familiar with, with these journals. And uh, well, and then th they are also some of my work during the COVID over the past two years. So I hope uh, we, we can have more discussion after that. And then I, and I also hope that maybe these papers will give you some more information that what people are doing, I mean, all, all over the world, talking about social and, and, and COVID. And then and one, one more thing is that uh, these papers are all are openly, uh, can be open access. And then same as so, so many other papers in social work and, and also in other disciplines that when they are about COVID, many, many journals uh, will uh, consider putting them openly access to everybody. And then also thanks to some of the researchers, they also use their, their resources to make those uh, research visible to a lot of people. And it did help a lot of people, especially for those in the developing uh, countries. So I think we all did a lot of good work together collectively, especially among my our profession. So, um, well, let's take a look at some pictures first. And well, even though these pictures look familiar to all of us, but actually these are not pictures of COVID. And in fact, these are pictures of SARS, which is already around 20 years ago, which when it hits Hong Kong and uh, and in fact, for those who, who, who might already forgot, 
actually Hong Kong has been uh, affected by uh, pandemic, the SARS pandemic, 20 years ago. And then at that at that time, um, in especially in Hong Kong and some other places in the world that are also affected by SARS, you know, people are wearing masks everywhere. And then you know, the medical practitioners are, are walking around, running around in the city everywhere to to take care of the, the people. These image today is so similar. And uh, well, so and this is also the reason why I start my first study. And uh, well, the first study of mine is uh, actually it's not purely about COVID because at that time uh, we we were just uh, one, mm, one, one month or two months uh, after the first uh, uh, outbreak of, of uh, COVID. Or no, no, not, not outbreak, after the first case being found uh, about COVID. So at that time, at that moment, COVID has not been spread widely because it has been spread to some places, but actually still uh, at the very beginning, uh, I mean, the, the 2020 of February. So at that time, I did a systematic search of some of the items which related to outbreaks, not just COVID, but to outbreaks. And then among the, uh, the uh, 43 major social journals, that is in the uh, journal citation reports. And I did that search for um, uh, for a period of 20 years. And I used the terms over here like this, you can see pandemic, uh, outbreak, and then I also used some of the uh, uh, names of the virus like the SARS and Mars and then other some other type of virus and I, I well well after I did this search surprisingly I I can only find 14 articles in uh, uh, over the past 20 years so I mean at, at, at that moment I I, re I emphasize again is it's just um, at the very beginning of COVID so uh, a list of study were fine in this study but then uh, of course as you have if you have these kind of um, experiences of doing these system systematic search, there are a lot of papers which, which are, are irrelevant. So after all the manual screening and it's just only 14 articles of, are found relevant. And even more surprising is that uh, half of them uh, are not research articles. Only half of them are research articles. And then among those seven, research articles, there are six qualitative studies and only one quantitative research articles has can be identified over the last 20 years before COVID. So this is kind of a surprising result that I can get. Uh, but of course, I have to add something. I'm not saying that uh, there are nothing else being, being published uh, uh, in, around the world, but I, of course, the search is uh, within the, you know, the tw uh, 43, major social work journals which have impact factor all right so uh, of course there are still more but uh, the, the scope of, of the search is uh, among these group of uh, journals and uh, well these are a list of those papers that um, uh, over the last 20 years and then uh, it's I just spend oh, an afternoon and then you can finish all the paper and well, as you can see, um, they are they are uh, uh, some of them. They they are research paper, but they do not have a quite a, a large sample size. And then they some of them are about SARS, and then some about some other pandemic. But then, uh, well, I think um, at that time, uh, actually, we already had the experience of pandemic, and you know, for SARS, for Mars, for H one N one, they have spread widely in this. Uh, developing countries. But one of the findings of, of, of mine is that the majority of those articles uh, were about the context of those developed uh, regions such as Canada, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore. And those developing and undeveloped countries and regions were very underrepresented in these studies. And uh, and no studies were found related to the densely populated countries such as you know uh, China and uh, India. This is some of my reflection for this first study that I that I conduct. Uh, academics and social work were were unable to provide an immediate and substantial response to capture those lessons learned from frontline social work practitioners and also academics in those pandemics before. And then another surprising things that I I have reflect on these. 
the search is that the first study on social work intervention in response to SARS was not published until 2007, which is four years after the initial outbreak of SARS. And then, and then another thing, surprising thing is that I I, I know that we have we 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 have a lot of um, uh, colleagues and also make we have, we have um, uh, journals editors and then also colleagues who are working in the editorial boards of social work journals now here in this conference I'm sure, and over the last twenty years those high impact social work journals remain quite detached from the outbreaks and then only two articles are accepted in the Q1 journals in social work. That's what I found before. And then we have COVID, all right. And then we have COVID, and then uh, uh, time flies. And one year later, um, I did this search again, and uh, and then it's now uh, 2021 of February, okay. And one year after the first known case of the COVID, I did a similar literature search in the major social work journal. Now it's a totally different story. And I, I conduct this again, and then there are a total of um, 256 articles being found in the um, in the uh, 43 major social work journals. Okay, I pretty actually the, the search um, strategies is pretty much similar. Only I only I I feel more uh, keywords regarding to COVID, and then uh, this the only thing that this indifference is that. Um, there's one more journals are being um, uh, included in the general citation report. So uh, there's, there's only two differences. But other than that, there's, there's, the search strategy is pretty similar. And and now only within one year, we have more than 200 articles. So uh, I think it's, 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 it's a sign of how uh, how good we are. I, I, I mean, how responsive we are. I mean, all of us and in, in our uh, profession and, and in, in, our, in the social work academia. And among those um, articles, they are contributed by scholars from more than 40 different countries and have used uh, a lot of citation. It is just as of uh, last year, but I think nowadays is we, we have much more. And um, well, I think when I compare the um, my earlier study, with this, uh, with this literature uh, uh, review, and I think um, the social work academics and also the journal editors are now uh, nowadays right now are not detached from the outbreak anymore. So, um, and then uh, another thing is that I observed is that the, those papers were quite widely covered, and um, they include a uh, not. In terms of you know, uh, in terms of the methodology, also uh, also in terms of uh, the uh, service users they are targeting, also in terms of the intervention they are talking about. So this is they are widely and, uh, and of course also in terms of the format, this is also widely covered. And and within the final uh, uh, collection of papers, and um, eighty five of them are research articles, and then one hundred and seventy one of them are in other formats. So uh, among those uh, research articles, uh, we can see that um, and the majority of them are quantitative studies, and then they, we have some qualitative studies, and then we have some papers on mixed method approaches, and then there are also some systematic reviews. And among all of the studies, we have involved a total of uh, 46,195 research participants. So now it, it is a massive number of people who are being researched and then create a lot of different new knowledge and information for us to to work on. And uh, these are these are lists of the top ten large scale quantitative studies um, among those two hundred fifty six papers. And you can see uh, for for most of them, they are more than uh, a thousand uh, participants, and then some are even reaching six thousand. Okay, so and then it covers a lot of different topics. And uh, and uh, within different service settings, and then uh, another reflection that I have uh, from this new um, that is the second systematic review is that um, the authors um, also consider presenting the studies and or their conceptual arguments in a form of commentary or brief notes, which helps them to uh, facilitate a more rapid dissemination of knowledge, and also the also we need to help and the support of journal editors. So and they accept manuscripts 
in uh, many other formats, such as reflective notes, such as news, such as um, editorials, and, and even poems. And, um, and then we do not just have social ac academics to contribute to the um, journals. We also have uh, direct social work practitioners. We don't also have social work students, and then even we have uh, service users to participate in these, in the process of submitting papers to journals to disseminate, disseminate knowledge to journals. And among those these papers, um, there are uh, there are a lot of invisible or valuable populations are being identified. So here are uh, the list of them. Okay, I have them um, uh, categorized in the paper, so you can take a look. And of any of them, in, in case you're interested, including, of course, children, young people, students, family, older adults, but more importantly, those who are more in more disadvantaged circumstances, such as, you know, those older, older adults with rehab or medical needs, uh, caregivers, immigrants, migrants, refugees, people in informal settlements, patients, survivors, health healthcare workers, and people in workforce. And then, um, well, uh, I, I don't have time to go through the, 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 the entire paper. I list out some of the findings and then you can have just have a glance at what people are talking about. I mean, what scholars are researching on. Uh, for instance, for older adults, they there are research on the deaf older adults and those who have hearing loss and then uh, academics uh, uh, conclude that they may not be accessible to public information regarding COVID because of their limitations. And then we also have older adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, and during COVID, they need to stay with multiple people at residential care facilities. And some of them are not uh, able to understand the concept of social distancing. And also older adults living with HIV and because of COVID, their, their diagnosis and their medical care because of, uh, of, of uh, COVID. Uh, are being delayed or being uh, disrupted. And besides, uh, there are research on patients and survivors and, pa and not just the patients with COVID. And some um, academics are uh, focused on uh, re patients with non-COVID related, but urgent and emergent health needs. And so these are also people that might be overlooked during COVID. And then some research uh, focus on, on oncology patients and their carers. And because those people are kind of uh, being disconnected themselves from the community and public services. And, and even the, those cancer survivors, some academics will point out that they, they may be uh, facing a double crisis because they con being constantly reminded about their own death and other people's death. So these are some of the other. And then uh, for immigrants and uh, migrants and also refugees, there are research on undocumented workers and also research on refugees and also, uh, and then there are also some um, uh, uh, practical um, suggestion and also uh, uh, consideration that uh, uh, suggest by the, by the uh, researchers. And there are also research on people in uh, informal settlements and uh, for, for instance, people who live in the slum area and uh, researchers point out that they are facing COVID and the, the, the main problem they're facing is not just COVID and the, the problem is uh, systematic mi marginalization, poor policy, in, inadequate planning. And uh, but luckily there are in some places like Canada and Poland, there are initiatives to help people who are experiencing homelessness crisis in the COVID. So these are some ex examples that uh, the, the academics have tried to listen out and then to inform us how we can do better. Well, and uh, and of course, uh, besides those needs being uh, addressed, and we also have the, the, uh, the academics also list out a lot of solutions and suggestions, and also a lot of new initiatives that they, they have point out, including um, some initiative in the in the in the hospital in Israel, and then also in using the online method. There are in in Australia, there's telehealth. In US, an online family-based prevention program, and then we also have virtual social care with the older back adults, and also some some in some country we have social media campaign, and which echo uh, what Mary uh, just mentioned about uh, one of the uh, legacy is that we are using a lot of technology nowadays in, in order to tackle the, the, the COVID. So, and then also some of the scholar also mentioned about the, um, uh, the uh, socially assisted chat robot using for in long-term care service facilities. 
and also some uh, academics in Hong Kong uh, uh, invent a device which can help uh, to improve the living condition of those people living in uh, disadvantaged circumstances. So these are some of the solutions, but of course, and then there are constant reminders for us that we sometimes we do, we do not need uh, uh, the cutting edge technology. We do not need a lot of resources. In some cases, like in US, the academics point out that we they, they just use a telephone outreach program. In Portugal, they, they just use television program. And in China, some academics uh, suggest using interactive TV because sometimes we just need to use so co those conventional typical uh, a way that for us to en uh, encounter our clients and it's, it's good enough already uh, during, especially during the crisis. And then after all, I, I think one of the one of the questions that I want us to consider is that um, actually what what makes social research unique? Um, well, during during COVID and during the process of me, you know, doing these kind of systematic system, systematic review, I I can I can I can I can see that there is a very keen competition in the I, I mean, to, especially during during COVID in you know in those uh, high end uh, medical journals, there are a lot of keen competition happening, and of course also in you know in our profession in social work profession, and one of the reason that. Uh, I mean, especially for the last past 20 years, there are not of there are there are not a lot of um, uh, social papers being published. One of the reason I think is that um, we kind of, um, I mean, some of our academics might not consider social work journals as their first priority to 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 do the publishing. Of course, because of our reasons. Okay. And and then I think one of the one of the um, uh, things that we can learn from these papers, and not just the their connection between COVID and social work. I I, I have this list of paper uh, uploaded to an uh, an open source platform, and then you can also access to this platform and um, uh, using the uh, using the link that I provide in the paper. Okay, and in and you can see that there's a list of paper like this uh, in, in, a, in a form of Excel form. And the, the, the point that I want to make is that and because I'm also teaching social work research and well, well, I, when I'm looking at this paper and I, when I'm sharing with the student and I would I would I would say to them and these are most of them are really social work research and these and in terms of their uh, the, the, the way they frame the research question, the way they, they did the research, the way they, they look at the problem, the way they make the implications, they I think most of them are excellent example of social work research. And I, I hope and I think these, um, uh, uh, this group of paper can re ha let us reconsider what is our uniqueness, I mean, for us, for doing social research. So, um, and then, uh, well, because of the time, I might not have uh, time to uh, go through the, the third paper that I want to share, but I just uh, give you a quick uh, recap of uh, another paper that I, I, I also uh, write with uh, some other colleagues uh, about the um, uh, health equality issues uh, for the people in Hong Kong. And then um, uh, one of the main um, uh, uh, observation that we have in Hong Kong, the lesson learned in Hong Kong. Nowadays, we uh, at, at this moment, we are uh, facing the fifth wave of pandemic, which is the most serious uh, 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 stages in, in, in Hong Kong. And then, uh, uh, but the profession was generally ill prepared for the outbreak. And these are some of the pos po possible courses. And after we consult our, ex our um, uh, experience in Hong Kong, first, we are just uh, 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 not prepared. And then we haven't, we haven't been prepared at all. And another thing is that we do not have a clear articulate inter intervention agenda. And the first, our service are too um, inflexible. So these are some of the key points that by looking for it. And um, I think um, there's a need for the social agencies to develop contingency plan to deal with the crisis. And then scholars and practitioners should work together to explore the roles that our professionals should, should perform. And then uh, including we have to uh, consider how to develop new crisis intervention models for us as a social practitioners. 
And then, yes, at the end, um, despite all the challenge and the hardships that we have been have been through, I want to salute to all the social practitioners for their persistence and renders effort in supporting the disadvantaged during COVID. So that's the end of my sharing. Thank you. Well, thank you very well, thank much. Thank you very much, uh, Johnson. Um, it's uh, great to see the way in which, uh, at least with the COVID uh, uh, crisis, um, social work has been able to respond much more uh, fully to uh, the difficulties that uh, different nations have faced, but we still have a lot to learn and a lot of things to uh, try to get right in our response to these important global crises. Thank you very much for that really interesting contribution. Now we can move to uh, another contribution from uh, Dr. You're going to have to um, tell me how to pronounce your name when you start your contribution, Dr. Vincent, um, from uh, South Africa uh, to make our third contribution. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, my name is Vincent Mavurira. Mavurira. Thank you very much for that. Yes, uh, the title of my presentation is COVID-19 pandemic and social work practice in a low-income country, the case of Zimbabwe. Uh, though I am based in South Africa, I am a Zimbabwean national, uh, working at uh, Northwest University in South Africa, but born and bred uh, in Zimbabwe. I will start my presentation. Uh, just like most countries across the globe, African countries were caught unaware and ill-prepared uh, by the COVID-19. And most of these countries have uh, poor health infrastructure and uh, budget constraints. Uh, they rely mostly on donations uh, from developed countries, which were heavily affected and had to cut aid. There are quite a number of uh, donor organizations uh, from Europe, from um, America, that help or fund uh, health uh, interventions uh, in developing countries. And uh, But uh, the unique uh, thing with this COVID-19 pandemic is that also the donor countries were heavily affected and uh, they couldn't uh, support the disaster, the COVID-19 pandemic, as they used to do uh, in previous um, uh, pandemic. Uh, as of the 2nd of uh, March 2022, there were um, 11,449,076 cases of uh, COVID-19 uh, in Africa. And um, since my presentation is based on Zimbabwe, uh, for those who don't know, uh, this is uh, Zimbabwe. It borders Zambia, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, and uh, Mozambique. Uh, Zimbabwe is a Southern African country with an estimated population of around 14 million people. It is uh, a volatile political uh, and economic uh, environment. 60% uh, of the economy is informal, which means uh, people, they self-employ themselves in urban areas, as you can see on this photo, those are people selling second-hand clothes, uh, mostly from Europe. Uh, the country is characterized by endemic poverty and unemployment. It is uh, a dilapidated health infrastructure, and it has a total of uh, 214 hospitals, and very few social workers are employed by the government. Uh, there is a government department of social welfare or social development and I'm sure as of 2014, it employed around 121 social workers. And I still believe up to now, the number is still less than uh, 200. And there are very few uh, infectious diseases hospital. For example, in Harare, the capital city of Zimbabwe, there are two main uh, infectious diseases or communicable disease hospitals. Uh, when it comes to uh, COVID-19, the first case was recorded on the 21st of March, 2020. And uh, on the 30th of March, uh, a 21-day national lockdown was uh, declared, and these lockdowns have been renewed and eased and renewed again over the past two years. And as at uh, 14 March 2022, there were 242,515 cases recorded and uh, 5,404 deaths, and there were 232,205 recoveries. And uh, the vaccination rate is around 27.3%. Um, uh, 
the measures that were put in place by the government uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic include ban on public gatherings, closure of schools and uh, universities at some point, travel restrictions. For example, at one point, people could not travel more than five kilometers, except essential services staff. There was ban on entertainment and recreational activities, border closure, except for uh, returning residents and cargo. Uh, social distancing was uh, encouraged, massive testing and contact tracing, mandatory um, masking in public gatherings. Then what is also important to bear in mind is that uh, during the pandemic, there was an era of myths and misinformation. At first, most people did not take the virus seriously. I can give, I can quote, for example, the Minister of Defense uh, of Zimbabwe, um, Opam Chinguri. She, she at some point said, coronavirus is the work of God, punishing um, countries who imposed sanctions on us. And remember, this is the Minister of Defense who was saying this at a rally, and by uh, those countries who were, whom she referred to as having been punished, it was mainly uh, the USA and uh, some European countries, including the United Kingdom. Uh, there, were also, uh, there was also the use of unconfirmed traditional medicine, including other medicines like uh, RFV. People were just trying to mix, if you can see at this photo, people were trying to mix whatever they could uh, in order to fight uh, the pandemic. Also, there were beliefs of spiritual healing. If you look at this photo at the top, these are apostolic church members, and these are most of the church, uh, churches that believed that COVID-19 can be addressed through sp spiritual healing. And some people also believed that when the virus, uh, sorry, the vaccine was introduced, some people believed that it was a way to eliminate the black race. And there was also belief that uh, men who take COVID-19 vaccine who experience erectile dysfunction. And even some believed that uh, those on at antiretroviral therapy will die when they take uh, the vaccine. Some believed that uh, it was uh, COVID-19 was a punishment from God. Some believed that it was the end sign, one of the sign of the ends of the time the world was about to end. So there was, you can see that there were so, so many myths and uh, uh, misinformation around COVID-19 in Zimbabwe. So, um, Let's look at the challenges that were ushered by COVID-19. It was, uh, it is probably the most challenging circumstance since the history of the profession in Zimbabwe. Uh, social work was introduced during the colonial period around 1966, and though there have been some um, disasters, um, but I believe that uh, COVID-19 is the worst since the history of the profession. And this COVID-19, it increased uh, poverty levels among the already poor and suffering people, it increased the vulnerability. Uh, and this was witnessed by uh, increase in cases of child marriages, mental health challenges, and loss of household uh, incomes. Uh, even during the pandemic, Zimbabwe could not offer any social pro any meaningful social, social protection uh, to its citizens. Remember, there was a lockdown. Uh, people in the informal sector could not go and sell whatever they sell or do their businesses. And at the same time, the government could not provide any meaningful resources to them due to uh, shortage. There were reported cases of uh, human rights abuses. For example, when people were forced to stay home, those who tried to move out uh, were arrested and beaten by the police. There were also increased uh, cases of gender-based violence. Uh, most people who, who did not stay together for a long, we're now forced to stay at home and um, cases were recorded of uh, gender-based violence. Let's look at uh, just a brief uh, background of social work practice in Zimbabwe. Our social workers are men employed by the government and non-profit organizations. Unlike in countries like UA, UK, where I've read and noted that even some local authorities employ quite a sizable number of social workers to practice in their areas of jurisdiction, that is not the case in Zimbabwe. If there are localities employing social workers, there are very few. However, it is important to note that uh, social work is uh, a regulated profession, uh, regulated by the Social um, Workers Act, and there's a council uh, called the Social Workers Council of Zimbabwe. 
However, due to limited resources, uh, the council is not doing its job. For example, they can monitor the patches, they can't even have some sessions. Social workers, social workers generally, uh, they earn a mega salaries and uh, they are demotivated. And most of them are moving out of the country. There is a serious uh, brain drain. They are going to Australia, the UK, and, and other developed countries. There, there is also, it is also important to note that uh, there is limited budget for social welfare or social development uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, the, the ministry that is responsible for, um, for, for, for social work is not, is not uh, funded well. I, I can't even give the figures here because uh, the currency that is used is not stable. And these are uh, social service officers that uh, are located at district offices. We have around 60 districts in Zimbabwe and there is no decentralization. So you find that uh, it is common for clients to travel even 80 or so kilometers to meet a social worker at a district office. And uh, some of the clients, they don't have the resources uh, to do so. As a result, they end up not accessing um, social work services. Then uh, in terms of uh, social work response to COVID-19, it is important to note that uh, the government identified uh, social workers uh, as essential service providers. However, uh, like I said earlier on, clients had to travel to social work offices. Uh, due to the hard lockdown that was imposed, it was difficult for those clients to access social work services as they could not be allowed to travel um, uh, more than five kilometers at some point. Uh, visual care, uh, what, one of, uh, what I noted that one of the presenters called it uh, digital something something, it was constrained by lack of technological resources. For example, the clients, they don't have the gadgets. Some don't even have cell phones, some don't even laptops, some don't even have any other devices they can use uh, even if virtual care is to be provided. And also some government departments, most social welfare offices in Zimbabwe, they don't have uh, modern uh, technology. So even if the social workers want to provide the services, uh, they, they can't. There's also the issue of data. Due to poverty, most people cannot access data uh, and also uh, connectivity issues in remote areas. There are no um, uh, network provision in most parts of rural Zimbabwe. And as a result, uh, people who stay in such areas cannot access uh, virtual care services. Um, both statutory and non statutory social workers provided the following services. Uh, education and provision of information to fight misinformation. Like I said earlier on, there were some myths and misinformation around COVID-19. So social workers were involved in uh, educating people uh, and providing the correct information about COVID-19. Also, uh, there was also provision of psychosocial support uh, to victims. The, as you might remember, there was a lot of fears, uncertainties, losses, and other psychological problems that were associated with uh, COVID-19. And there are quite a number uh, of uh, non-governmental organizations that were providing material and monetary assistance to needy families and social workers were involved in that. There were also a, a number of uh, quarantine centers that were set up by the government, especially in border towns and major cities. And uh, they were managed by the Department of Social Development, uh, which, which is uh, the parent uh, department for social workers in, in Zimbabwe. Social workers were also involved in our vaccination campaigns. Uh, when the vaccination was rolled out, uh, they were actively involved uh, in that. However, like I said earlier on, uh, social workers faced the number of challenges and uh, the biggest challenge was uh, lack of resources. It is possible in Zimbabwe to find uh, social welfare offices without even a single vehicle to use at district level. And also, I mentioned the issue of uh, um, um, uh, remote working was a challenge due, due to a poor technology in some areas. And there was also lack of uh, personal protective equipment. At some point, the government could not provide these uh, to, 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 to social workers and other healthcare workers. And I remember at some point, uh, healthcare workers in Zimbabwe had to go on strike 
because they had to work without uh, the uh, appropriate equipment to protect uh, uh, themselves. And just like any other um, uh, individuals across the globe, social workers also experienced some strains and stressors of the virus themselves. And there was no meaningful uh, employee assistance programs to help them. So they had to fend uh, for themselves and they had to soldier on. So basically this was uh, it pertaining to um, uh, social work practice in Zimbabwe. However, it is important to bear in mind that uh, African countries were not uh, hit so hard like uh, most uh, European and Asian countries by the pandemic. As you can see, uh, our, our total number of cases since the beginning of the pandemic are around 230,000 and uh, around 5,000 deaths. Despite the poverty and the confusion um, uh, that we have in, in Africa, we still had um, a, a good recovery rate. Even if you look at uh, the vaccination uh, um, uh, program, most people are not yet vac uh, vaccinated, but right now we have got uh, very low cases. So basically, uh, this is it pertaining to uh, social work practice uh, in Zimbabwe during the pandemic. Uh, I end here. Thank you. One of the interesting things that I think some of the people in Kingston might feel is that some of the experiences that they've had um, in uh, quite a rich and well-resourced country with lots of uh, digital resources shared some of the um, uh, experiences that you've described and it's uh, Johnson's uh, work which looked more broadly in the, the global academic response also raises many ideas that have um, that, that connect with um, uh, widespread experience. So this is not something that's, um, it, it has been experienced differently in different parts of the world because of the position that uh, different countries are in, but it's a shared experience that, that we've had. Um, and I'm struck also by some of the uh, difficulties that um, uh, have been shared, which are about the position of social work. The, Mary has talked about the struggle to keep going uh, and to maintain the quality of our response with the uh, people that we've always worked with. Um, and what we know, uh, and Vincent has made this very clear, is that the people who have the most difficulties, who struggle most, who need to be helped, who suffer most from inequality, will suffer most from the crises that affect our societies as well. And that's come through very clearly in what you, you have said. Well, um, our speakers have been uh, very disciplined in their contributions. Thank you very much for that. We've managed to start a little early too. So there is an opportunity now for people to take part in the plenary discussion. And so I think uh, it's over to Rick to have a look at the contributions that people have made and questions they've been asking. Thank you very much, Malcolm, and hello, everyone. I'm Rick Hood, Professor of Social Work at Kingston University and one of the people um, organising the conference today. So it's uh, my job just to go through the chat and the Q&A and uh, just to uh, bring to your attention some of the some of the uh, comments and experience that have been shared there and uh, direct any questions to the to the speakers who have been kind enough to uh, stay on and and answer anything or, or comment on anything if they can so if i if i uh, just quickly go through some of the things that have been shared by people who've been who've been listening to the to the presentations um there's um well i think uh, just draw attention to the uh, from uh, natalia who uh, uh, you know expressing solidarity um as as we have with the with the people uh, of ukraine also, uh, pointing out that um uh, racism is uh, of course one of the um uh, 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 things that uh, people are also experiencing and, uh, and there's, a, there's a link there as well to um uh, to different resources around that and of course it's very uh, hugely relevant as well to to COVID the subject of uh, co uh, of this uh, of today's conference and the inequalities that surround people's experience and uh, and suffering during the pandemic 
Um, moving down the chat, there's um, there's a comment. Uh, thank you from uh, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi uh, Suresh, for, who's attending from India. Good to see. Uh, thank you for for for, for coming. And um, yes, please do share any experiences that you have from your from your countries. Anyone attending, and we'll we'll bring those to the, to uh, to everyone's attention because uh, although of course there've been commonalities and similarities in in what's been happening uh, around the world and the response of social work to that, it, there are obviously uh, many differences as well. Uh, Dr. Lechmi is a, in fact oral healthcare professional, so again it's the uh, that multi multidisciplinary perspective that is always welcome. Um, uh, Tammy, who's a parent activist, um, has um, uh, I think was listening to, to, to Mary's presentation um, as well as Dr. Chung's with great interest, um, thinking as well about the role of um, of people with lived experience in getting their voices heard and directing and leading and contributing to research. So that's maybe a question we can come back to to the to to the panel shortly. Um, uh, this 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 is about the role of people with lived experience in in, uh, uh, in producing research research outputs and research findings. And then uh, some uh, comments later down in the chat about, um, uh, ad yes, advocacy and lived experience. And um, uh, if I turn to the Q&A now, there is a, a general question um, for the panelists, which are about the lessons that social work as a profession uh, has learned, you know, during the course of the pandemic. It's obviously a huge question um, and, and again it may be something that looks different you know, in different contexts and in different countries uh, and uh, and also whether actually as a result the profession um, it is better prepared or would think differently about global disasters uh, such as the pandemic and whether we're better pre prepared as a profession for uh, something like this happening happening again and of course Covid is ongoing so you know is the profession in a better place now than it than it was at, at the start. People have been very pleased to hear about the different experiences and um, how Covid has uh, manifested itself and been addressed in different countries and uh, you know it's obviously hugely impressive to hear about um, the work of colleagues in uh, in Zimbabwe and variety, I suppose, of responses we heard about in the systematic reviews that John Sum was talking about. Those are the comments that I can find so far. Please do uh, put anything that you um, would like to to share or to ask of the panelists in the chat. Natalia, who's um, from uh, Brazil originally, living in the UK, uh, comments that having worked uh, with families and children in care that. Uh, professionals in the UK, um, there's a lot of work to do basically in terms of understanding the situation of families from different backgrounds and that there's a over-representation of particularly migrant families so, uh, in, in child protection. Uh, and a comment from Clara saying that training ought to be co-designed and co-delivered with experts by experience. Uh, so uh, Yes, Tammy, I think uh, uh, so. I think there's some interest uh, if uh, going back to the the speakers, if if, if they um, to, to comment on aspects of this, I think there's some interest in hearing more about uh, the role of uh, people with lived experience uh, in terms of how they contribute to knowledge and training of professionals and to the uh, production of knowledge um, about COVID and social work. And then I think there's a, there's also a general interest in knowing about what lessons have been learned uh, in the profession uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, de dealing with the ongoing consequences of COVID, but also the question of are we, are we better prepared for the, these kind of global disasters uh, in, in, in the future? So with those uh, queries in mind, uh, would it be OK to to uh, go back to the, the, the speakers in turn? Feel free to share anything um, uh, else that you, you think is relevant. Um, we have got time. We'll be pausing for a break in about 10 minutes. Starting off with uh, Mary, would you, would you like to go first? Is that OK? So pick anything that you like out of those questions and queries and uh, feel free to add anything relevant. It's a general comment really about the involvement of 
user, capturing the user experience in research. Um, it's something that we always put in research proposals and we're always committed, or at least the teams I work with have been committed. It becomes really difficult sometimes when you get down to local authority level to actually do that. And I suppose it's a plea for us, those working in local authorities, to work with us and how best to do this. And I certainly found during COVID, although the local authority work I did didn't really capture the voice, um, with the easement work, um, which was looking at adult social care and the relevance of what the government had done to easing duties, we did want to get through to, um, to people who might have been affected by it. And that was difficult because they were in place for such a short time, local authorities didn't want them, so there would have only been a small group. It proved impossible and there really was a lack of cooperation over that. And I think over the child protection work, yes, we did we did work with um, parents who'd been through child protection conferences at that time. And what they contributed was enormous. And I think it added greatly to our understanding of what was going on. And also the opportunity to counter what was, I think, um, a positive response overall from social workers an understandable one because they had to get on with the job, but I think that they were far more positive about what was happening with parents than parents actually thought they were or about their own experiences. And a very quick word really about changing um, social work. I think one thing that was very noticeable, particularly when we were looking with adult social care, was although neighbouring authorities were important, and what the government said wasn't always helpful, but was listened to. New relationships, new networks, the importance of working together with a group of authorities in a region really did come to the fore. And I think there might certainly be within adult care a reshifting of something around that in the future, but we'll see. Thank you, Mary. It's really helpful. Johnson, um, Dr Chung, I, think, I wonder whether you, you had any comments to make about uh, uh, the, the uh, some of the questions and queries uh, raised. Yeah, yeah, maybe some quick response to some of the concerns that are uh, raised by the audience. And uh, one thing about the research uh, opportunities and also the research uh, direction. And I also, um, I also um, I have mentioned uh, in, in my sharing that actually uh, uh, we need, I think we need to, we need to publish more. We need to do, do more research on, on COVID and pandemic and social work and publish more in social work journals. This is one thing that I want to stress. And I think we have colleagues here. We have also have um, people who have who are um, suffering from COVID and also we have different type of people here. And I think we have a uh, friend experience of helping those people also, or, or we have the experience of suffering from COVID ourselves. And those are valuable lessons that we can share and have to be shared of, uh, using the, the channels of journals. And then, but the one thing is that um, I, what I observe is that the acad academics in social work are less keen to publish in social work journals when compared with other journals who have, you know, higher impact factors or maybe some are in other discipline. So it's, it's, it's time for us to, we consider the importance of building up the scholarship of our own discipline. So this is one thing that I want to advocate to, I mean, to everyone here. Another thing, another thing I want to share is that some kind of personal feeling. Uh, when I when I kind of comparing these the the days that we fight SARS in Hong Kong 20 years ago, and nowadays we fight the pandemic. Uh, of course, as uh, we were not prepared before and then we have like resources and we have lack of information at the time we fight uh, against SARS. And uh, when comparing today, we, uh, the technology and everything is more advanced. But one thing is different is that we are kind of lacking the solidarity in a society. I mean the collective energy to fight the pandemic together, which 
due to a lot of reasons, uh, mainly you know political reasons, and also people are more divided, and then because of the because we're entering the digital world, and then people have different opinions, and and because of all these reasons, I I think these are something that have to be done by social worker, by frontline practitioners. So I think for us, particularly in Hong Kong, I, for the case in Hong Kong as an example, I think this is one important thing I think so social workers has to has to face and then to th find ways to deal with and in terms of how we how we fight against not just the COVID, but the but the new world that we are facing. So in, in one of the paper that I, I, one, I, I remember clearly in one of the paper, the name is two pandemic because we are fighting two pandemics together. <laughs> the, the one pandemic is the virus and that pandemic is the other things happening in our world today. So I think this is pretty much my quick response to the concerns of the audience. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that the point about solidarity is, 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 is hugely strikes a chord at this time as well, isn't it? And, um, and, and that's the thing that really has been one of the, the key things that has ebbed and flowed you know, certainly in, in, in this country, in my experience of it, is that the, the idea of solidarity has been uh, hugely important at different times. And then, you know, that then there's been obviously questions and scepticism at different times as well. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's the same, you know, across across the world. Just looking again, just at the at the Q and A. There's a there's a comment that uh, some services uh, it's interesting to be planning. Uh, to to retain online element to their provision, which uh, which is which is not always welcome to some people, and it re reminds me really of what um, uh, Vincent was saying about the situation in Zimbabwe, where there's the, the the services might have all the tech and everything set up. If Valia wonders if we entered a similar pandemic again, would we do better next time? It's always a, a question <laughs> uh, to be to be answered. Question from. Uh, Dean, who, who is a social work student from Zimbabwe, uh, who's interested in understanding the training of social workers. Um, so, so that's quite quite handy uh, question to to turn to Vincent with. Um, not only to answer that, but to just to comment on anything that you've heard, Vincent, though, that you would like to respond to. Um, finally, uh, thank you. Uh, social work training in Zimbabwe has been there since um, uh, the nineteen sixties. And it was then heavily influenced by uh, social work practice in the UK. Remember, we were a colony of um, Britain. So most of our things were just um, emulating the British system. Thank you, Vincent. Um, and, you know, personally, I learned a lot from your presentation about the situation in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe. It, was, it was really informative um, and given us a lot to think about. Uh, well, so I, th I, th I think it's, um, I think I'm not seeing anything new. So I, I, I think we will close the Q&A for this half of the morning session. Uh, just to, to uh, thank our speakers this morning, uh, Vincent Mabruira, Mary Beginski and Johnson Chung-Sing Chung, uh, very much for all the insights they've given us into uh, what's happening, not only in their local context, but around the world and given us much food for thought this morning. Uh, we, we will now take a break and uh, in the meantime, if you want to add your thoughts or, or, or questions, please uh, continue to do that. And we look forward to welcoming you uh, for our next series of speakers very shortly. Thanks everyone.